My name is Marie Christine Rosner, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Vienna, where I work at the Quantum Information Science and Quantum Computing uh, Group of Professor Philip Alter. And yeah, throughout this day, I've been trying my best. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an informatics person. And I've kept hearing, well, there are two views on that thing. There is the law perspective and there is like the engineering perspective. And maybe I'm offering a third perspective. I'm a physicist, so I'm gonna tell you something about, yeah, my thoughts on how quantum information theory might be relevant for data security and people concerned about data security also in the future. Um, I will give you a very brief overview due to the limited time. If there are any questions, feel free to ask me afterwards. I'll just state the facts that things exist and I won't go into the, any details why they work or where they come from. So when I was thinking what to tell you, I got up with three things that might be relevant from quantum information theory for data security. And that's on one hand, there once we will be able to build a quantum computer, that might be a threat for classical computation, so uh, for classical cryptography. So that's a problem. I also have a solution which is called quantum cryptography, and it's a very nice concept I would like to tell you something about. And then there's also a new possibility you would have if there were quantum computers around, and that's called blind quantum computing or quantum cloud computation, which I will tell you very briefly about in the end. So what's a quantum computer? Um, I guess most of you don't really have a lot of ideas what the quantum computer is. Um, just to state very briefly, what's quantum physics? Um, quantum physics usually comes into place when we talk about very small systems, so like single quanta of light, single particles of light, so-called photons, or atoms, molecules, very small scales. And very different rules apply for quantum physics than we know from our everyday world than classical physics. So a lot of things seem to be counterintuitive and this seems to be hard at first, but it also opens up a lot of new possibilities for us to use um, and to use for computation. So I guess you all know, of course, that classical computers are based on bits, so they can be zero, they can be one. Uh, quantum computers, analogously, are based on something that's called a quantum bit or short a qubit, but that can be more than zero or one. It can be in a so-called superposition of zero and one, so it can be zero and one at the same time. To be more precise, if you uh, imagine that zero and one are like the north and south pole of a sphere, your qubit can take any point of that sphere as a valid state. That allows you to encode much more information in a single qubit. That comes at a drawback though, there's a caveat that reading out that information is harder and you will not, it's physically impossible to totally determine the state of a single qubit by one measurement. Furthermore, any measurement on that qubit will alter that qubit. So there are some things that make it more tricky to work with these things. Um, to keep it very short, I thought, okay, let's just tell you something about advantages and disadvantages of quantum computers. Why would I care? So let's start with the things that make it a bit hard. Why don't we have quantum computers already? So Qubits are by far less stable than classical bits. Like you can imagine with those two arrows, if they're disturbed a little bit, you probably still know what you want it to send. Um, a quantum bit, well, it has a lot of more possible states. It can be, um, yeah, changed easily. It can get disturbed. And there are two problems with that. One, of course, you might have an error in your computation. You can deal with that with error correction, but it makes it more complicated. And the other thing that's more severe is uh, if your qubit interacts in a wrong way with its environment, it might lose its quantum features, that's so-called decoherence. And then, well, all of your quantum advantages you worked really hard for to get are lost. So it's really important if you want to build a quantum computer that you isolate your qubits properly from the environment, that you protect them from decoherence. So this is like the hard parts in building a quantum computer is one, for instance, isolation. Then right now what we're fighting with is upscaling. So getting the few qubits that we have already in the lab, so we can already control few qubit states, scaling that up to many, many qubit states that would actually allow us to tackle the problems we want to tackle with a quantum computer. That's what we're working on right now. And another thing I want to mention is, um, because I've also been asked, is like, if you talk about security, is this like security in saving data or is it in transmitting data? It's always in transmitting data because we do not have quantum memories yet. So saving a quantum state is close to impossible right now, but it's an active field of research and there are promising um, developments there. But keep that in mind. So advantages. Of course, quantum computers are cool, otherwise I wouldn't do like research on that. Um, there, 
they allow us to use new resources that a, quant uh, that a classical computer just doesn't have. I also want to emphasize that a quantum computer is not just a faster computer. It's not just anything, actually. Um, it's based on a really different physical systems that allows us to use different things. One of them is parallelism. That's what I also, what's also called superposition. What I already mentioned, that uh, qubits can be in many states at once. So you can evaluate a function for many inputs at once. That's a cool feature. But the problem is, again, the readout. So you cannot fully access the information you get out of that um, simultaneous evaluation of the function. For that, you could use interference. So if you want to uh, build an algorithm uh, very cleverly, you can make the possible outputs you, could, you have in this quantum state interact with each other such that, you'll, such that you enhance the ones you want to have and just suppress the ones you don't want to have. And that's done using interference. And then there is entanglement, which is also a very powerful resource for a quantum computer. It's also a very complicated thing to explain, but just consider it for now as a stronger correlation than possible classically. So two or more qubits can be entangled, and that means they're connected stronger together than that would be possible in classical physics or classical information. So what can I use a quantum computer for? If we are able to build a large universal quantum computer, we could, for instance, do quantum simulation. So again, quantum stuff, why would I care? Um, for instance, for designing new drugs, uh, molecules are quantum systems. So if you can, use a, you can use a quantum computer to simulate other quantum systems and find out its, uh, things for research, for designing new drugs. Um, this is much more efficient than a quantum computer because it's based on the same physical principles. Then you could do faster searches. So searching for a specific entry in a database, it's much faster than a quantum computer. And that's done using the so-called Grover algorithm. And then there's the thing that's probably most relevant for the community here. That's factorization. So there is an algorithm called Schwarz algorithm. And that's an algorithm for integer factorization. So integer factorization, for those who don't know, you have a large number n, and you want to find the two factors, p and q, that if you multiply them, they give you n. Why do I care about that? RSA encryption, a very widely used encryption, is based on the assumption that factoring is a hard problem. So the security of a lot of things we have, uh, we are using right now, is based on the fact that it takes a classical computer a very long time to, fa uh, to um, factor a number. So bad news is that a quantum computer can solve it uh, in polynomial time. So that makes it, for those who are interested in complexity classes, part of complexity class BQP. That means it's much, much faster than a classical computer. So if your security right now relies on the fact that it will take a classical computer a long time to break your encryption, and now you have a quantum computer that does it much faster, your security is basically gone. For those who want to know how it works, you can ask me later. But in principle, it relies on superposition of input and something called a quantum Fourier transform. So as a conclusion, a large universal quantum computer would break RSA, meaning it could break it much, much faster, so in a like, time that's relevant for us now. And therefore, it's a threat to, uh, for our, like right now, for cryptography. So I'm often asked, where are we now? How long will it take until there is a large quantum computer? So I thought I'll give you some numbers. I'll go very quickly through that. There are different ways of implementing quantum computers now. We are not sure what's the best yet. I'm working on so-called photonic quantum computers. So I use single light particles. And the best that has been demonstrated here are 10 qubits. So that's still very far away from something that would really break your encryption. Um, ions, you can trap, uh, trap ions and use them as qubits. There is an Innsbruck group that does great work on that. And they have 14, 16 qubits, something like that. Um, there is superconducting qubits. Um, IBM, for instance, has put uh, their connected a quantum computer to the internet, so you can basically use it from home. They have connected a 5-qubit one some time ago. I think they have connected a 16-qubit now. You can uh, access more or less for free if you register, and if you pay for it, you can access their 17-qubit one. And then there are specialized machines. I want to mention them because you see them on the news a lot, like, for instance, the D-Wave machine, who claims to have something like more than 2,000 qubits, which seems like insanely more than everyone else. And I would just, say, I just want to say two things about that. One, this is not a universal quantum computer, and they do not claim to be one. So this is a specialized machine, a so-called quantum annealer, and they're trying to solve a specific optimization problem. So not a universal computer. And there's still a huge debate in the community if this actually shows any quantum advantage at all. 
So there are huge investments in that and they're working on that and they seem to do like build amazing machines. But since it's from a company, it's like the community can also not just look at the paper and see what exactly they did. And there is still a big dispute if there's actually any um, use over a classical machine from that machine. I just thought you might be interested in what a quantum computer might look like. This is the heart piece of something I did my master thesis on and that was a universal four cubic quantum computer, a photonic one. And yeah, there are a lot of optical elements. There are lasers you don't see in the picture, the detectors you don't see in the picture, but this is kind of the heart piece. I'm not gonna explain the parts because I don't have time for that now. So what's the solution if we break classical cryptography? There are two approaches right now. Um, one is so-called post-quantum cryptography or quantum safe cryptography. And that's basically quantum uh, classical cryptography that just says, okay, let's base our uh, encryption on a different mathematical problem for which we don't know if there, so for which we don't know a quantum algorithm that would break it, which is a valid approach, but you cannot, at least I do not know of any uh, scheme that's proven to be secure from quantum computers. So it might be that at any time someone finds an algorithm for a quantum computer and just breaks this post quantum cryptography scheme. And then there's quantum cryptography uh, which is based on quantum systems. So of course it's like more work to implement because you need to work with this new system, but it has a huge advantage that while any classical cryptography system I know about can in principle be broken if you have enough computational power and enough time, quantum cryptography is secure by the laws of nature. So if you implement it perfectly, it cannot be broken in principle. That's a very strong claim and that's quite um, an amazing tool to work with. They're the first systems are already commercially available and you can buy them. There is some caveat because from time to time you, you find like publications that they find problems with the implementation where their side channels open up and then there's still some information leakage. But in principle, if you implement it perfectly, it's theoretically secure. So I'm gonna go very quickly over that because I have to shorten my talk. So just to clarify, if we talk about quantum crypto cryptography, most of the time we talk actually about quantum key distribution. So what you want to do is you want to distribute like a key to two people, which then they use to um, encrypt and decrypt their message. And we will call like the community. And I also will call those two people, Alice and Bob. And this Alice and Bob can find out if someone's listening to their key distribution. That's the huge advantage of quantum key distribution. So you try to distribute a key from Alice to Bob. And if someone's listening into that key, they will necessarily, so, okay, Alice and Bob, will distribute some quantum systems. And if someone's listening in, they will need to make a measurement on that um, uh, quantum system to, dis to get some information out. And as I mentioned, measurement always changes the quantum system. Furthermore, it's theoretically forbidden to copy quantum systems, to clone them. There's something like a no cloning theorem. So she, uh, an eavesdropper cannot just make a copy and measure that. So Bob will notice that there's some errors in his key when he compares his key with parts of his key that he will not use afterwards, obviously, with Alice. So if they see that errors have been introduced, they know someone listened in. Okay, so much about quantum cryptography. I have three minutes left, I think, to talk about quantum cloud computation and the rest I wanted to talk about. So I will just briefly state what it is. If we would have a large universal quantum computer, the first quantum computers will for sure be in some specialized facility, some specialized lab, maybe some huge company has one. And let's say you want to access that, but you don't want the company to have your data. Good news is that if you have some very limited quantum power at home, you don't need a quantum computer. Um, you need just, maybe you need to manipulate like single qubits. That's something that's really doable. You can delegate this computation, your computation, arbitrary computation to this quantum server without that server knowing the input to your computation, the output of your computation, and not even the algorithm. So even like the software you're running is secure. The computer itself does not know what it's doing. There's like minimal leakage, like the length of the program, the maximum length, of course, because you interact with that system for some time. But in principle, your input, your output, and your algorithm is safe. Yeah, I, we used to have some illustration and we're hoping at some point maybe there's something like quantum internet where you can just delegate your um, computations to some central quantum server and you're sending uh, quantum particles between you and that server. So, and now I have a final slide and I wanna say, you should think about when this will, when will this become a problem for me? I've been asked that. And then I cannot tell you when we'll have a full quantum computer. 
There are people who are saying 50 years. There are people who are saying investments have gone up a lot, so maybe it's just 20 years. We don't know. Maybe someone tomorrow has a huge breakthrough and just builds that quantum computer. But quantum computers will be a problem for your encryption. So you should think, well, how long will I take to implement changes in my security system? This is the minimum time like you need. For that time, you won't be secure. And then you need to think, how long does my data need to be secure? Because there could be data that needs to be secure for a long time. And right now, if you transmit data with standard encryption and someone just saves that encrypted message, they cannot read it right now. But as soon as they have a quantum computer, they can encrypt everything back in time, everything they saved. So if you have data that needs to be saved for a long time, maybe you should start thinking about what to do. Uh, how long does your data need to be safe? And how much time are you willing to bet that it will still take to make a full quantum computer? So yeah, another thing you might, I, maybe just an input for thinking, is how, I wanna, how are we going to deal with the fact if one person, like one government, one company has a quantum computer and suddenly is able to decrypt all the messages on the internet? Should one person have that power? Is there anything we can do about that? I don't know, but maybe that's something we should start thinking about. With that, I want to thank you for your attention.